That's me. Uh, the first person on our wall over here is someone called Apoka Kanyani. Uh, she is a woman from the north, a place called uh, Bogotanga, Bukere. And what she's known for is using, she has this pestle here that they, they pound millet and pound things with. And basically, back during the slave trading days, when the people came in to start capturing slaves, Africans and slaves, she was able to uh, do a little distraction, get the head slaver and kill him with her pestle. So when she did that, that uh, kind of put everybody on notice that that wasn't the most hospitable place to go for slaves. So she's a hero to her people there. And in fact, they call this the pestle turn to blood. Uh, Queen T of ancient Kemet in ancient Egypt, a lot of you all would have heard of her uh, or heard of, but this is an opportunity for me to explain the blackness of ancient Kemet or ancient Egypt to these students because all of them have all of the literature, of course, with all of the European or Arab looking people in Egypt building pyramids, starting mathematics, starting civilization and all the rest. So this is when I began to explain to them that all of those things that they've seen in these little books that they've been given, usually through the church, uh, have the wrong people in there as representing that first civilization. Queen T, of course, was in the 18th dynasty, mother of Akhenaten, uh, wife of Amenhotep III, and one of the most influential queens in ancient Kemet. Up you mighty race, uh, Marcus Garvey. You see I have him front and center. As I mentioned upstairs, we're Garveyites, and so we believe that we have to build something to power here. He says, up you mighty race, you can accomplish what you will. That means whatever it is you want to, what we put our minds to. Uh, the greatness of Marcus Garvey, United Negro Improvement Association, over six million members all over the world. It hasn't been repeated before or since. Um, now, since we're here in Ghana, of course, the people, Ghanaians know the, the most, and then, of course, outside of Ghana is Kwame Nkrumah. Uh, a lot of things you can say about Nkrumah. The main thing people know him for is being the first, uh, you know, a Ghana or Gold Coast, Ghana being the first place to be uh, decolonized and, and independent. But I chose to put this up here for the, not so much for the children, but for just everyone. And so uh, he read all of these uh, big brain Europeans, Marx and Hegel and all the rest of them. But the one that did most to influence him was reading the philosophies and opinions of this Marcus Garvey. So if you don't know Garvey, when you read this one, especially their teachers or what have you, they say, well, this must have been a bad man, right? <laughs> I thought I was going to do something else. He's a bad man, or uh, Nkrumah certainly couldn't have had him. So then the Black Star line, which Garvey started, of course, Black Star, everything you see here in Ghana, all this comes from Garvey. Well, that's an eye-opening, eye-opener to a lot of Ghanaians, and it helps us to put Garvey in context, as I said. Uh, if we're at a place here, New Ningo is really Karbu Kope, Kope meaning town, so Karbu town, because uh, Jonas Karbu was actually the founder here, and the first um, king he brought uh, was Tejangma the first, first chief of this area of New Ningo. So just out of respect for the local yeah. people here, we, we, we put their founders at the beginning. Uh, I chose, I chose Ethiopia, uh, Jamaica, Ghana, of course, and our, our red, black, and green. Uh, just to kind of bring it all together and just trying to kind of hit the cardinal points of the diaspora, some cardinal points, and so that's what it is. I mentioned before, Leazare in the Gruni language, or Fra Fra they call it, is, means Aquaba or welcome in that language. All right, let's be quick. I have this whole wall here, which I've, over three, about three or four years now, I've been threatening to do all kind of things with this wall. A village scene, a war scene, 
need this blank wall here. This blank wall right here. So, uh, so I just keep painting it white and keep thinking about until, it. Until it comes to you, right? <laughs> The, the, last, the last one that I heard uh, that was suggested having to do with like a, a battle scene, you know, I thought it would be cool, you know, like a Zulu against the, the, the British or, or somebody doing something, you know what I mean? And then on one side, on our side, you know, we have all of the support people, you know, like people bringing the ammunition and stuff. And some people bringing food, other ones, you know, whatever they're doing, you know, the whole logistical train. So that was, uh, that's, that's an idea. Okay, so here, um, I start the children with Eve, because uh, any geneticist who's got uh, a junior certificate knows that the Homo sapiens sapiens, which is our group, our species of human, uh, originated in East Africa somewhere around 200,000 years ago. I always make the point that no one left Africa until about 70,000 BC. So from 200,000 to 70,000, 130,000 years, there was no one in the world who was not uh, black on the uh, black African on the African continent. And then once we started migrating out, then I explained to them because they always want to know how did the you know the whites come and the Asians and all of that. So that's when we talk about the melanin and the in the skin and the vitamin D and how we, you know, you, you need a certain amount of vitamin D in the body, so if you move to a place that doesn't have much sun, you know, then you start shedding melanin to get more vitamin D in to do the functions of the body, these kind of things. And so, uh, sometimes I get these, these reverends, and every now and then I get one of these missionaries, and they want to stand up and, and make a lot of noise about it. So usually what I do then is I just let them talk, and the more they talk, the less credibility they have because, you know, the story don't make any sense. And like the children are like, huh? <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I find that the people who are really fired up about that are, are very poorly versed in what they're, what they're angry about. So wow. that makes it easy. <laughs> Chinua Achebe, uh, Nigeria, things fall apart is what most people know him from. But he's just a great all-around writer. He's an Igbo. He was one of the uh, top supporters in, inside the Biafra movement when they were having the uh, uh, separating Biafra war and the movement separating themselves from other parts of uh, Nigeria. And just a brilliant all-around writer. I encourage you to read all of his stuff because he really gets into the minds sometimes of the Africans and how we are behaving in these different pre- and post-colonial scenarios. Asa Hilliard, some of y'all know Asa. Asa, when I was 19 years old, I was in school, and he, uh, he, he came and did Free Your Mind, Return to the Source. And I was like, what are you talking about, you know? And so, once again, I was talking about how we get these black seeds in us. I had them in me coming up, and then when Asa hit it, it was almost like it just set that back on fire, you know? And I was like, okay, here we go. We got, we got real, and I started reading. You know, he sent me a book list. Can you imagine? He just had his book list and he made all kind of notes on it, put it in the mail and sent it. There wasn't no email and mailed it to me. And that's how I started reading the books. He said, read this one first, then go here. And that's how we did it. And that's Asa. He was also, you know, he's a psychologist, historian, Egyptologist, all the rest. He was also in, in, in stool as the chief here in Ghana too, down in the, uh, in the central region. Uh, yeah, Santua, you hear a lot more about her, yeah. Queen Mother of Jisu. She's a sister who was uh, a lot of, bringing a lot of the backbone to the fight against the British uh, by her, her men there, the Ashanti uh, fighters. By the time she came along, the British had really done a lot of damage, so she was really trying to repair the damage. So you'll hear of the Ya Santua Wars. You gotta remember, they, they struggled for almost 100 years against the British, just trying to maintain the sovereignty. This is her helmet. Hidan Kimathi, yes ma'am. Is, is this her helmet? Because it looks like she's been visited by... Um... Well, you know, there's only... there's I've only seen two pictures of her, and they're all both very blurry. In fact, that's why, you know, we had to kind of add our own yeah, detail. Okay. But yeah, but one that I saw, she had that kind of helmet that, you know, just that, yeah, just like that. Yeah, she's been in touch with um, the others. Yeah, okay, well, maybe that's what that means. Didan Kimathi. Kimathi, a lot of people will know him from uh, 
uh, Jerry Rawlings, who is the former president of Ghana, he's named his son Kimathi. And that's the first time, first place most Ghanaians would have heard the name. But they don't know he was named after Didan Kimathi, who was head of the Kikuyu Land Freedom Army, which the white folks called the Mau Mau when I was yeah. growing up, you know. And it became to know you Mau Mau, and like, yeah. you know, you talking about what you don't know. But the real Mau Mau, or the Kikuyu Land Freedom Army, of course, had to go to the bush and fight the British to try to get their land back. The British had taken all the best land and done the damage that they do. So he's one of our absolute heroes. And Zynga and Bande, some of you have heard some sisters renaming themselves in Zynga. It's after this sister who some 500 years ago fought uh, for a long period of time to not only maintaining her sovereignty, but trying to suppress, eliminate the slave trade in the area where she was. So, you know, we always hear these stories about how no one fought and we sold each other for mirrors and all of that stuff. But we have example after example where we tried to bottle up that trade because, and even doing that, still not knowing really how horrible it really was going to be on the other side. You know, no one, because none of these people could imagine chattel slavery. Right. You know, where you just got no rights as a human. I mean, they, they, they so Is you can she imagine. Wanted, didn't she warn the ones like she put like uh, some of the slave traders against each other? Was, well, a lot of yeah, people tried to play one against each other just yeah. to maintain that thing. So yeah, she did with limited success. Uh, that's why she just had to end up fighting for most of her life. Yeah. Ajete, uh, in World War II, the West African re region regiments fought in World War II on the side of the British and the American, you know, against the Nazi Japanese side. And uh, they fought in place Burma, where they were able to expel a whole lot of the Japanese from there. So. They, they were offered and told they were going to get all these benefits and all of these good things once they got out and it was all over. And then they reneged, the British reneged on it. So what they did, Ajete and a couple other men with other people behind them, marched on Christenberg, the capital at the time here, the castle where the British were still holding court. Uh, and they were shot and killed by Major Emery, a British uh, major. And that sparked the Accra riots. And when that jumped off, that's when they started Jalen and Kruma and all these other big six. And that was really the beginning of the end of the colonial order. So he's known as like the, the tip of the spear of uh, ending colonialism. Maurice Bishop, a lot of y'all from the U.S. will know Maurice Bishop. Uh, if you remember, uh, the U.S. invaded Grenada back in 1983. And why did they invade them? Many, you know, there are 100,000 people, the whole population can fit into the Rose Bowl, you know, so it cannot have been a threat to the U.S. So the only reason they were getting rid of this him and this place, this movement called New Jewel Movement is because they had reduced literacy to almost, illiteracy to almost zero. Um, they were export, no longer dependent so much on importing food. You know, they're doing all of the things that are, an independent, self-sustaining country should do, and they were worried that they was going to have a black Castro. Is that what they were trying to do? So they destroyed that and tried to kill it, wow. in, the, kill it in the cradle. That's really good. That was about. Yeah. And so there's a there's actually a movie. Oh no no not on that one. I'm thinking Panama. So yeah. No. Grenada. Okay, Namatan warriors from Dahomey. Dahomey is Benin. Oh, yes. And these are the sisters who are, oh, yes. again, at the tip of the spear fighting, in this case, the, oh, yes. the French who would colonize mm. uh, Dahomey, which is Benin. Mm. And uh, as you saw, they used the women in this uh, Black Panther, I'm told. Uh, they were modeled after these Namatan Amazon warriors out of Benin. So, um, long history there. Uh, you can read much more about them in the French. You know, as a French writer wrote about, you know, what they were up against dealing with these systems. In, in, in high school, I heard about these okay. women in high school well, you had in a, Michigan years and years you had a ago. Good high the homie, they have a movie. Yeah, they, uh, yeah. You, you had a good high school. Oh. You know, most women telling us nothing. Yeah, the white folks. The white folks were there. You know, they slip up time to mm -hmm. time. Uh, Edward Wilmot Blighting, St. Thomas, he was, that's in the Virgin Islands. Uh, he's arguably the father of Pan-Africanism, or one of the fathers of Pan-Africanism. Even before Garvey and those, you can see books, Africa for the Africans, which is, uh, I think, the theme of this group, actually. Well, he wrote a whole book called Africa for the Africans in 1884 or something like that. Uh, of course, he was also a, an educator, uh, just an overall thinker. He moved to Liberia and became prominent. Uh, Islam, Christianity, Islam, and the Negro Race is the book that he's 
probably most popular for, although he's written of it. Uh, Steve Biko, when the children come here, they I ask every class, have you ever heard of apartheid? And I don't think I've seen one hand go up among the students yet. This is five years. Because in their school, do they teach you about apartheid? They don't teach them about apartheid. So they know, uh, you know, Henry VIII's wife's, fifth wife's shoe size, you know. That was on the test, you know. But apartheid, what is that? So, you know, this is how upside down our educational system is here, just like it is in the U.S. I mean, what did we learn? You know, George Washington never told a lie, right? Except for all of them slaves he was on it. Outside of that, he was a good guy, you know. So, no, all of this kind of stuff is global. But anyway, this is what I have to talk about, uh, teach them what actually what uh, apartheid is and tell them about segregation in the U.S. and Steve Biko starting the Black Consciousness Movement, South African student organization, of course, being murdered uh, by the South African authorities for his voice, for his voice. Sonny Ali of the Songhai Empire, you know, we had the Ghana, Mali, Songhai, the great West African Empire. This was the last and largest of the three. So Sony Ali was able to, um, you know, really organize this place for power. He had some four to five hundred ships on the Niger River. He had uh, 14 or 15 major provinces organized throughout uh, the empire. And uh, I always say that you, you'll find some disparaging words about him by a lot of the Arab chroniclers having to do with him never having fully accepted Islam. They said more or less you know, superficially, but you know, he was all about his his native African spiritual system, and that's what he adhered to. Yes, sir. They have a movie out on Steve Biko called Cry Freedom. Oh, Cry yeah. Freedom that mm -hmm. came out a long time ago. I remember when I went to see it was Denzel Washington when he yeah. was young. Yeah. And you know, as soon as I got, you know, went and got some salt on my popcorn, came back, Denzel was dead. You know, so then I had to spend, you know, the rest of all of that time listening about this guy, this journalist. I didn't even get to the end of the movie. I'm like, I can't see about Steve Biko. Y'all knocked him out in the first 15 minutes. I got to watch this hero. I mean, let me just go home and watch, uh, you know, Magnum P.I. or something. Save my money. Okay, but anyway, here we go. That's Sony Ali. Uh, behind them, I was just mentioning these Amazon warriors, these sisters. Uh, the homie, again, of course, struggling against the French. They call him the Great Shark. You always see him with this long pipe. But um, those women were got some of his frontline troops. Uh, Mary McKeeba. Now, once once I've mentioned uh, apartheid in South Africa, then we can talk a little bit about her being kicked out of South Africa for her apartheid, anti-apartheid singing and activism and all of that. Almost three decades out there. But she raised money. She raised awareness. She sang. She did everything humanly possible for a person in exile. She was married to uh, Stokely Carmichael at Kwame Ture for some time. They lived in Guinea. Um, that's our sister, Mary. She so, got to, yes, ma'am. The Lady Smith Black Mambaza, they from uh, South Africa also, the singing group. Mm -hmm. yeah. Lady Smith. Lady Smith, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Black Mambaza, South Africa. Yeah, Lady She's Smith, whatever that is. grew up listening to her and them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, awesome. Yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. How do you say? Got diamonds on the sole of her shoes. Don't get me with my little fake click going on. Well, I don't see any clouds coming to save us, but we can break. We're in, we're in pretty good time, I think. I mean, we'll go until y'all raise that you. Okay, so we'll get you to uh, the big ones, one of those big ones, and then we'll break. Okay, the great Shekanta Job, you all know Shekanta. Uh, more than anyone else, he and Obenga probably closed the book on this whole is Egypt or ancient Egypt to black African civilization. You know, in 1974, they had the UNESCO conference where all the Egyptologists came together to discuss the peopling of Egypt, and of course, they were so much more prepared than all of these other Egyptologists who've been getting away with this for years and years and years because nobody came to just challenge them like, okay, what about all of this data? What about what all of the uh, ancient Greeks and everything said? What about all of this botany that's all, what about the language structure that's clearly African? What about this? What about that? What about Nubia and all of that? 
All of that stuff nobody had any answer for. They just been going along putting pictures of Yule Brenner up and hoping <laughs> nobody noticed, you know what I mean? Like we tired. So Shay got to the appeal and being on, they put all that to bed. Wasn't he a member of ASCAC? Of ASCAC? Yeah. Uh, I don't know if he was. I know okay. that ASCAC, uh, what became ASCAC, uh, I had a conference in 84 with him in, in okay. was it 84? Mm -hmm. I think it was 84 in Atlanta. And they honored him at the uh, at Morehouse, and, and the mayor came out and the whole thing. But I don't know if he. Was he was a okay. Yeah. Now Obenga came and, and supported ASCAC. Obenga, you know, the guy who studied with them. Uh, he supported. I was in ASCAC, so I know he supported us. You know, with some things at the time. Uh, JJ Desaline, we like Desaline. People like him because they feel like he was more of the iron fist behind the Haitian Revolution, especially after uh, Toussaint L'Overture was deposed. Um, Desaline, uh, we, we I like to tell the children, and you also got to remember, the children have heard of Napoleon, mm -hmm. because these things, you know, Napoleon's army, the, the French army, is the greatest in the world, the Roman army, got to know how many spikes were on the bottom of their shoes. I mean, it's crazy. So they got all of that stuff in there, Mm -hmm. Right? But when I tell them, well, these Africans from Haiti were able to overthrow and defeat Napoleon's army, the great Napoleon, you know, it, it, they're confused because nobody's defeated Napoleon as far as they know, <laughs> except for these brothers and sisters, you know, so just puts a little more context. A lot of times they don't quite believe, you know, I'm not, they're not even sure the teachers look at you very incredi incredulously because they've never heard that before, and so it sounds strange, but you know, they're not in any position to disprove it. So we put it in there and let them know. Also, Haiti was Aiti, you know, the, 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 the natives had to call the police Aiti before the French and the British and everyone else came. And of course, they changed it to Santa Domingue. So, so when they took over, they gave them their original name back, even though, of course, most of the original people were had been wiped out at that point. Uh, George Washington Carver, you know, it's interesting that some children come, they look at this and they say, so the first, that, that your first president was a black man. We didn't <laughs> say, no, this is George Washington right. Carver. It's him, okay. <laughs> you know, yeah. but, so we have to do that. But, you know, of course, the agriculture genius at the time. And, and if you ever get a chance to go to Tuskegee and see his, oh, yeah. uh, his thing, it's like, I didn't even know. I thought I knew a little something about him. I'm like, what? what? You know, I know he did that. George Washington. Julius Nereri. Nereri, of course of Tanzania, you know, one of uh, the founding fathers of the, the uh, Organization of African Unity. Of course, he tried to implement a lot of these uh, good things that we talk about in Kwanzaa in terms of collective economics and, and all of these type of things. Try to put that in the structure of his government uh, when he came out of the colonial order. He also had enough foresight to try at least to put some kind of East African community together although it fell apart, but he realized that you had to have something other than these colonial states. Mm -hmm. And another reason I have him up here is he always was giving material and military support to the frontline states like Mozambique and Zimbabwe and the rest who were fighting, you know, against uh, colonialism in, in their own right, especially against the British and the, and the Portuguese. Now, Ephraim Mamou, if you're a Ghanaian, uh, Ephraim Mamou, he's come out of Peki in the Volta region. Uh, not only did he write one of their anthems, but he's uh, spent all his energy trying to maintain the culture, the language, the music, the dress, all of these things, the African, because you've got to remember, this is in the face of the British on cultural onslaught, you know, and he did his best, and he held off the tide as well as he could, but you know, still coming, and some people are still resisting. Harriet Tubman. Um, most of you all will know her from Underground Railroad and, and the movie, I guess, that was out not too long ago. But for our children here, they really don't understand much. They don't understand slavery in America almost at all, at least the ones that are going to school now. And um, I just give, give this one example usually when I give the tour, which is I, I mentioned about them working, us working with no pay, you know, for slaves and all of that. And I got down a few few down here, and then 
uh, the children were still chatting with each other. And I said, well, what's going on? Why, why are they talking? And the teacher said to me, she said, well, they thought you said that you worked for no money. You weren't paid. I said, yeah, that's what I said, all them centuries without pay. And then she translated it back to the students. And they were like appalled. You know, it's like, you mean, you know, so like I always say, they thought we was getting checks every Friday since, you know, 16 something, you know what I mean? That's why they think y'all got money. So this is how it works, you know? I mean, it's really crazy. That's how bad the history uh, has been. Uh, Samora Michelle uh, of Mozambique, uh, he was a protege of Manlani, who we'll talk about a little later. Uh, he was a nurse by training, revolutionary by uh, disposition. He was able to uh, fight back against the Portuguese. He, he staged his first uh, incursion, guerrilla incursion, back into Mozambique from uh, Tanzania. So that's an example I would say in the area would, would do these things, give material support for people who are trying to go back and, and win the colonization battle against, uh, in his case, the Portuguese. Uh, Nanny of Jamaica, uh, Nanny, born in Ghana, of course ended up in Jamaica. Uh, she was one of the famous Maroons. She was one of the famous Maroons who were able to uh, fight their way out of slavery, get into the mountains, run away, and she had become so powerful that they had to give her a section of the island. It was called Nanny Town or Nanny District or something like that. And I think, I haven't been to Jamaica, but it's still there. And so a lot of these people also, uh, there's a lot of names in Jamaica. Uh, uh, Bomani's from Jamaica, you know, the Kampong and the Termitang and the, and the Kujo and all of these. All of these are straight from Akan uh, people, languages, and groups. And I've been with, uh, and Bomani's sure much more with some of the sisters from Jamaica. They'll be out in the mountains. And they're still calling some of the fruits and vegetables by the same name you know, in Jamaica today that they still use in Ghana, so uh, can't get any clearer than that. Uh, Haile Selassie of Ethiopia, and of course he's uh, Rastafari. Uh, ra uh, when you're little, you're leads to Farai, Makonan, which is where he started, and then you become older like Prince Lee, and it's like Rastafari, Makonan, and then that's Rastafari, Rasta. But you know, he was, um, there's always a lot of controversy about him because people think, well, he didn't do everything he could against Mussolini and he, he put his faith in some of the UN and all. And so we, we try to take all of that into consideration. But on the flip side, you know, he, he was able, first of all, even to keep that kingdom together from falling apart and going all kind of different ways, you know, after Menelik and after, um, you know, what was going on at the turn of the century. Plus, he's also one of the founders of the OAU. And, um, Depending on where you come from, from Ethiopia, you know, you love them or you hate them. And, uh, and I've experienced that in this tour. Uh, Pianki from the 25th Dynasty, ancient Kemet. You know, Dr. Clark likes to call them the, the last, you know, true black yeah. dynasty. Came back and taught everyone how to be a dynasty again. We're talking 714 BCE. So now, remember, we go back three or 4,000 BC, you know, uh, in terms of the, the the uh, beginning of the um, Pharaonic Ages, Pharaonic era. So, Bianchi, you'll hear Taharka, Shabaka, some of the other ones that came from the 25th Nubian Dynasty. And you know, sometimes they try to say this is the, the Black Dynasty, you know, to make it sound like that was the only Black Dynasty. As of, and, and the other ones must have been something else. But, you know, the covers are off on that one. Uh, Shaka, the great Zulu king. Uh, I always say if you were one of the ones who were overrun by Shaka, he may not be a hero to you, but Shaka was able to consolidate a lot of territory. He's able to consolidate a lot of uh, different groups and provide some level of protection to the overall group and it'd be a deterrent to a lot of the incursions of the outsiders. Although, of course, after time went on, uh, we begin to lose those wars again. So if you've seen these movies, you know, he's done things about um, changing the, the structure of fighting with the large shields and the, and the short swords and these kind of things. That's a great shock. Of Fannie Lou Hamer, uh, she's here because the children, again, cannot imagine that there was a time when we couldn't vote. You know, and I try to tell them, when I was a child, it was very difficult for my parents to vote. Anywhere in the South, especially, I mean, they had 
all kinds of tests that you had to find out how many jelly beans were in a jar or whatever it is. And of course, you always fail them, so you never got to cook. And so it's hard. And so it's hard for them to to imagine because they have such a strong positive image of everything European or America. You know, justice, uh, constitutions, uh, constitutional law, voting, democracy, on and on and on. And then when I tell them, look, even when I came along, it wasn't a guaranteed thing. So. Fannie Lou Hamer was jailed, she was beaten, she was tortured, she stood up, you know, she was early in SNCC, uh, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, So she was known for doing her part and her courage. And so when I talk about these different attributes, what courage is the one that comes. What do you think about now? Uh, take a break before yeah. we hit the big ones? Yeah, family, yeah, we're just going to take a break, uh, that way everybody can kind of cool down, yeah. and then we're going to continue after our lunch. Oh, after lunch? But lunch, you said lunch was until 1. Oh. What time is it? We early? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, cool. So we're going to cool down. Well, we can still cool, cool down. Oh, that's cool good that we're early. We're going to cool down a little bit and we're going to continue. Cool.